do that, you're all probably going to get a prompt. And I think we're good to go. So welcome, Carmen. Uh, thank you so much for joining us at the supper hour and managing family responsibilities in order to be with us and to share with us kind of your journey with creativity and wellness. So over to you. Thanks so much, Elaine. Hi, everybody. I'm really pleased to be with you today. I am going to share my screen and um, give you a pictorial overview of what I do, because I find that, especially since we're sitting in different places, uh, let me just see here. Let's go all the way back to the beginning here. We're in different places and sometimes it's easier to tell you a bit more about me if um, I show you instead of just tell you. So I'm not going to be looking at my chat. Um, so, but I do encourage you throughout um, this little presentation I have for you to pop your questions or comments or anything you want to say in the chat. Um, uh, is it Chassie that's going to be monitoring that for us? Um, yep. so we'll, um, we'll go that way. We're also going to leave some time at the end for some Q and A. So, so don't be shy. Um, you can also just unmute yourself at any point. I always feel it's really strange to do these presentations, um, and not hear anything <laughs> for a while. So feel free to, to pop in and, and keep me company throughout this presentation. So as Elaine said, uh, we had a really great way of meeting, actually. I really um, was honored to receive an email from her out of the blue saying that she had found me. Um, and so that makes me feel like the world is not so big uh, since you were, most of you, I think, are based in BC, in Vancouver. Um, and I'm out here in Ottawa. So she found me, talked to me, and here we are today. So uh, we're going to talk a bit about creativity and wellness. And I am going to uh, do my best to share my journey and sort of where I'm at today. So whoop, let's go like this. I hope that you don't, do you guys see on the bottom of your screen, you are screen sharing or is that just what I see? I think it's just uh, what I see. Yeah, I think we're, we're seeing, per, what we're seeing right now is your, your PowerPoint Great. and we see a little picture of you, which is just perfect. Fabulous. Okay. So just off the top, I like to, to let people know uh, when I, when I talk to them that um, I believe that creativity uh, is in all of us and that we all have the potential to change lives through what it is that we make and show others. And so that's the mission that I'm on every day. And I think that it sounds like to me through the research I've done and talking to Elaine that crafters for a cause and the work that you all do is something that you believe in too. So I think we're in good company today. <laughs> Let's try not to have that do every, do that every time. So just by way of a short introduction or agenda for you, um, I'm going to tell you about who I am and the many hats that I wear. I'll give you a sense of my creative journey and how I got to what I make today. Um, I will also tell you about my art making process, um, processes. I have a number of different things that I do and then give you a sense of what inspires me and what I have coming up. And then, as I said, I'll leave time for Q&A at the end. Um, also, if I'm speaking too quickly or you're missing something, just let me know and I'll slow down. I tend to get really passionate about what I speak about. And sometimes I just quick up, <laughs> I get faster <laughs> because I'm so excited about it. So just tell me to slow down and calm down. So, hi, I'm Carmen. I wear a lot of hats. Um, I am never straight faced. If you follow me on Instagram, you can go look for me under my name or under Ply Studio 613. That's the area code out here in Ottawa, one of the area codes. Um, I don't often post photos of myself, but when I do, they're never serious. Um, so the many hats I wear, I always joke that uh, many of them are my free form crocheted hats because that's one of my loves. And um, I also wear the hats of creative business owner, uh, fiber artist, uh, experienced designer and learning designer, uh, facilitator, team builder, manager. What else? Wife, 
So my husband and I have been in love for almost 20 years and my daughters are now, they're a little bit young in these photos, but they're now 12 and 10 and their names are Everly and Maven. I also have a large extended family. None of them live out here in Ontario. Um, they live in Saskatchewan. So I'm a prairie girl. I was born and raised in Alberta in Saskatchewan. And here I am with my, these are just my siblings and their kids and my mom. So let me tell you a bit about my why, um, why it is that I even am talking to, to, to you today about creativity and wellness. Um, when I started sort of in on my road of creativity many, many years ago, I didn't call it creative wellness, but over the years, I've started to just refer to most of the things that I do and speak about as being something that is about connection, creation, and being well. So those are the things that I believe in, and that is really what sort of centers me on a daily basis to keep going in the work that I do. So let me tell you about that. My creative journey started, um, I guess, when I was very, very young. I had a great desire when I was very young to be either an artist or an educator. And through, uh, I guess, the twists and turns that we take in life, I didn't actually study either of those things in university. Instead, I went to the University of Saskatchewan and studied land use planning. And then I uh, promptly took that degree and moved to rural Saskatchewan to work for a Community Futures Development Corporation for a while. And then I went off to Harare, Zimbabwe to work with CETA uh, and CARE for a while. And then I came back to Canada, and as most people from Saskatchewan do, they moved to Calgary. So I moved to Calgary and did another degree, a master's degree this time in planning and urban design. And then I moved to Barcelona to do some work there. I finally found my way to Ottawa uh, in about 2005, because that's where my now husband was. And so here I went to work uh, for not the federal government, but the Federation of Canadian Municipalities. And I worked for almost 16 years uh, doing work with the municipalities across the country here in Canada. And I also did some international work with FCM as well. <clears throat> and I really loved it. It was very much aligned with my ethics and values. And it was, um, it was good work, but it was a lot of work. <clears throat> and so in my journey as a manager and then senior manager, I spent a lot of time on computers and in meetings. And I never had any time for anything else. And so my creativity was generally in the tank. And so whenever I could, I would try to find time to paint or to sketch or to knit, but generally that time was very, very little. And one of the things that I found in that time that really centered me was um, not yet spinning, which I'll tell you about in a minute. This is a spinning wheel, uh, but it was knitting. <clears throat> and the reason why I have a spinning wheel on this slide is because my journey took kind of an interesting turn while knitting in my lunchroom one day. My director walked by, as he often did, and sort of looked at me and I was knitting as I was chatting with my colleagues. And he said, hey, do you want a spinning wheel? And I said, no, thank you. <laughs> and he said, well, why not? And I said, because I just don't have time for it. I, I knit when I can, uh, but I don't have time to learn how to spin. So he left me alone and he said, okay, no problem. But a few weeks later, he said again, Carmen, would you enjoy a spinning wheel? I'll it's I, I, You don't need to buy it. It's just free. My wife doesn't need it anymore. We're going to get rid of it. And he said, if you come over, I'll pour you a glass of wine. So I said, okay, I'll come over for the wine. So I went over and I picked up this spinning wheel. And little did I know, it would actually change the trajectory of my career. Because after I got that spinning wheel, it sat in the corner of my living room for a really long time. And I continued to work at FCM. And then I went on to have some babies. And as I was sitting with my first child in the living room one day and looking at that spinning wheel, I thought I should really learn how to use it. So I took some classes and I did learn how to use it. And then I made a lot of yarn. And as my kids grew up, I would make yarn that would then become things that they would usually with these smiles on their faces, where? So 
I just kept making and making until one day in 2020, um, as most of us were on Zoom meetings, um, this was one Zoom meeting that day. Uh, I can't even remember what month it was anymore, but it was in 2020. And even though I could crochet on my Zoom meetings, and that was cool, um, I still had a stack of them to get through, and I was tired. And so I got brave, and I said to my boss, who was also my friend, that I needed to figure out an exit plan because I needed to leave my long-term great job, but I needed to try something different. And I was looking forward to starting my own studio. So I got brave and I told her that. And then in January of 2021, I went to my studio instead of going to FCM or going to my Zoom calls. And I will come back to this again in a minute. <clears throat> so this is <clears throat> some of the yarn that I make. And I will show you pictures of more of the things that I make and, and make now. Um, but yarn, I would say, saved my life. And then after I learned how to make yarn, weaving became a lifesaver because I had so much yarn that I needed to learn how to do something with it. So I started to learn how to weave. And I got so into the weaving that I had to make my own weaving looms. So my brother and I embarked on a journey to create and make all of these weaving looms that I now started to sell. And then I had so many weaving looms that I needed to teach people how to use them. So I started offering classes through other places. And then I started offering them in my own living room and dining room. And my people loved it. I had a great time teaching and um, it was super fun, but I was still doing this on the side. I was still at FCM. And here I was at FCM teaching people in the lunchroom and I was doing team building exercises for my team and for others. And yet it still wasn't enough. I felt very torn because I was hustling all the time and I was really tired. I was burning myself out because the thing that I loved to do was the thing that I was always doing on the side. And so I saw this one day and I thought again of my idea to just stop it all and to maybe do something different. And I kept repeating this to myself that I didn't want to live with regret. And I didn't want to think, what if I never had taken the path of doing something different? Because I could have just stayed in my cushy job indefinitely. And then I took looks at my daughters and I thought, how do I trudge off to work every day and come home so tired and so exhausted and help them to live a life that they feel fulfilled in? How can I do something different? So I decided again in this time period that I'm speaking of to just go for it, to be me with a vengeance and to figure out how to do something different. So Ply Studio came along, um, but it was a long, it was a long road. I'm not going to go into the ins and outs of starting an art studio, especially during the pandemic. Um, but suffice to say, I did get brave. I did leave my day job and I started the studio and it was, it was pretty good. I'll just leave it at that for a moment. So let me tell you about what I make, because I know that you're all makers and that you all make wonderful things as well. So maybe this will give you a little semblance of all of the things that I was doing in my spare time to try to uh, be well, because I love making things. And so it started with knitting, as I mentioned, or did I mention that? I think I did. Um, so my very first love in the fiber world, at least, was knitting, which a friend taught me in the winter of 2005. So I was a late knitter. I was already in my 30s. I didn't learn this when I was, you know, sitting beside my grandmothers when I was young. But then that that spinning wheel changed the game. So this one that I've shown you before. So this is where my fiber journey really blasted off. And now I have many more spinning wheels than just that one. This is my favorite one. It is a Magicraft Aura. So if you are 
a uh, person that spins yarn, you might know of a variety of different spinning wheels, but this one is particularly for the art yarns that I make, which are big poofy yarns that look like this and like this and like this. And sometimes like this, this one is made out of dog hair. And I like to make yarns that are rather unusual and very colorful and neon-like. And then I use those yarns to make things. So I make things like Christmas wreaths and cowls. I make earrings. I make pom-pom ornaments that go on Christmas trees. I make things, uh, These. this isn't my yarn, but I use um, macrame to do a lot of ornamentation. I make crocheted peacock earrings. I, uh, for a little while, I haven't touched it recently, but I, I have done punch needle. I make poofs <laughs> for my living room. I make ornamental things for all seasons. So crocheted pumpkins and little felted balls that go, um, you know, around the house at Christmas time. I make baskets and more baskets and more baskets. <laughs> I really like baskets. Um, and I make blankets during the pandemic. I made a lot of blankets. Um, granny square one on the right and um the one on the left is a crocheted ripple blanket uh which resembles ones that my grandparent or my grandmother's made for me and all of the grandchildren when i was young i've mentioned that i love freeform crochet so this is a hat made out of my own yarn that was commissioned by a friend for her daughter which promptly got eaten off her head by a dog <laughs> so these things happen but i do love making crocheted crocheted anything but crocheted hats particularly that are kind of Dr. Seuss like. Here's one that I made for another person um, that I really loved and interesting twist is here's the person at one of my workshops wearing the hat so I thought that was really special. I like to make tiny tapestries. Um, you can see my hand there to show you how small they are. But um, I've been particularly inspired in the last couple of years by a company called Chip and Sparrow out of Guelph. You can look them up. They design, it's a one woman company actually, and she designs beautiful little looms that are very mobile. And I've also been inspired by Rebecca Mezoff, who I've taken a couple of online classes from. And last summer I did the summer of tapestry course that she offers and she has I think it's open now for the summer of tapestry 2024 highly recommend it she even got me back into watercolor because part of her teaching is around taking your sketchbook out in nature and using your watercolors to try to like catch the colors and to sketch what you see so that you can then take it home and or, or tapestry weave it out on the on the trail but uh, I particularly loved last year making these color swatches and color blending boards out of watercolor. And then more recently, I've been making kind of weird twisty things like these yarn pretzels. And all through all of this, I make a lot of tutorials. So I do a lot of online teaching. So I make patterns and I make um, online classes. Some of them are available on YouTube. Many of them are in my digital classes. And I guess I make people happy is the other thing that I really strive to do. So by teaching people how to make things that they didn't know how to make or gain some more skill in, it makes people happy. I also make connections. So Part of my desire is to connect with other artists and makers and help them to also teach how they do what they do. And so I've been striving to do that. I did that through my studio, um, which I should say is now actually closed physically. Um, I ran that physical space for a few years um, and now I don't have a physical space anymore and I go to other people, but I still make these connections and teach with others. But really, it's all about the weaving. So let's just get back to that for a minute, and I'll show you some examples. So if you do weave or have woven before, um, you can weave on anything. So I'm showing you some examples here of, you know, one of my weaving looms that's warped. 
but I have woven on uh, on the right hand side everything from a picture frame that I took the canvas off of and put a bunch of nails in to yes license plates I have used my dad's old license plate um, as a frame for my weaving and then as I showed you before I have designed with my brother uh, a series of weaving looms and then designed um, this is a simple pattern that I designed uh, a few years back that I now actually sell on my website the pattern for and the and the materials to make it and I've taught it a number of times in person I just wanted to share with you just a few examples of some of the tapestries that I've made over the years as well um, I won't give you too much details on them. I do have a lot of written notes on these, and I actually believe I have a blog post. So if you are curious about some of my tapestries, you can go, um, and I'll give you all of my contact details, but you can go looking on my blog, and I give you the story of some of these tapestries. So um, because I do start most of what I do from um, an idea. So this one is actually a tapestry that's made out of one t-shirt and some roving. So it was a t-shirt that I got in Nashville. It's called Nashville. And it was for my husband. And as it was starting to wear out and get holes in it, I still thought the t-shirt was kind of cool and had interesting details on it. So I ripped it up into strips and made it into a tapestry. And so it still lives on. Um, it's kind of grungy and weird looking, but it is... Uh, cool to me because it is a time and a place made into a uh, wall hanging. This one is called I'm So Whittle. And Whittle is how my daughters used to say little when they were young and couldn't pronounce their letters very well. I actually made this one in the car when we were driving somewhere. And it's all just a bunch of um, reclaimed fibers that I was going to throw away. So I just sort of threw them all together and called it Whittle. This one is called The Unfinished Story of So Many Things. It's actually very large and it still hangs in my house. I do a lot of my weaving out of reclaimed objects um, and things that would have been thrown into the landfill. And so it's important for me to be able to, to write that up and to share with people what things used to be and so I often do that on my little tags um, and when I do exhibits and things like that I have even more of a write-up of things like this um, this one has this it's called the unfinished story of so many things because this one and when I'll show you in a minute or the story of motherhood for me uh, because for me the story of living a life and trying to be an artist and a business owner and all of the things when you have young children is that everything is unfinished. And so um, I often start things and then don't finish them for a really long time. I never really have a huge chunk of time to work on what I love to do. And so it always kind of is a work in progress from a long, long time. And so I just go back one. The reason why this ball of yarn is hanging off the side of it is because that to me is the indication that it it and much of what I do is always to be continued so it actually hangs that way this one is called flow um, I designed and made this one in the first month of the pandemic and I actually uh, created it on my weaving loom alongside another weaving that was supposed to be its sister um, and in the end, I didn't end up actually hanging them beside each other because I didn't think they actually worked together, which is maybe how sisters are. Um, but uh, that's sort of the story of how I weave is sometimes things work out and sometimes things don't. This is one uh, that is called Patterns or Such Sweet Sorrow. Um, I never work by pattern except for this one time. And I actually really enjoyed this in the end. I thought it was kind of cool and it was fun to photograph but I don't think I've ever followed a pattern for anything else that I've done. This one is called, I didn't think I was going to love you so much because I didn't. Uh, when I first started weaving it, it was a real mess actually. And then I kept on going, which is what I tell my students too, is if you don't like something, don't rip it out, wait till the next day. And if you still don't like it, 
put a few more rows on it. And so that's what I did. And I actually have loved this weaving ever since I made it in 2019. It's mostly made out of consignment store dresses and my old t-shirts. There's a, just a detail on it. This one similarly is made out of, I think my daughter's old t-shirts, some of my yarn, um, and then just bits that I had laying around the house. Um, and I really love color contrast in this way. So when I look at certain things, I don't think they're going to go together. And sometimes I throw them on the weaving loom and they actually really do pop. So I like that. This one similarly was another, I think, consignment store article of clothing. Um, and I believe what it said on it was something to the effect of we all use too much resource or something like that. Or it was like a nod to um, the sustainability of our planet based on our consumption. And so I used only recycled items in this work. Um, and uh, I thought it turned out pretty interesting. This one was a pair of jeans and a t-shirt and some of my yarn. And so similarly, I was just always experimenting and exploring what could be done with various types of things. Um, they are ragged. I will say some of my weavings are super ragged and <laughs> end up kind of looking scrappy, but in that scrappiness, I think that's where the story is. And so that's just the style that I have kind of um, engaged with over the years. And most of the things I make now aren't quite this scrappy looking, but I do like sort of this unfinished look like this. <laughs> this one, I think I called it Madonna because it felt very um, Madonna in her 1980s era. And um yeah, enough said. And then this is the unfinished story of so many things version or number two. And this one I made um, as uh, an entry into a book that I'm in about motherhood. And so this one took over 100 hours to weave. It might have even been more like 150 hours. Weaving is a very slow process. And um, it contains all kinds of things that have been with me through my journey of motherhood. So there are yarns in this one that I had indigo dyed at a workshop that, of course, never found anything else to do with because I didn't have any time. There are pieces of yarn in this that I've loved, um, things that I made when I was pregnant with my daughters. Um, and then there's the reason why it's uh, woven in the way that it is where it kind of looks like it's buckling against the wall is because um, of the ebbs and flows of life uh, as a mother and um, as a result of just the, the sort of the undulation of the times that we live in. There's also um, some sort of clouds in it and there's some silver, like silver lining. And then there's bursts of color and there's some gray and there's a tiny little mirror. I don't know if you can see it on the far right hand side that I found in my craft supplies one day. And it was one of my daughters when they were tiny, tiny. And I just stuck it in there and it sort of reflects back at you as you look at the tapestry. And that's how it looks on the wall. And that's the backside of it. I actually included this because, um, you know, as makers, we often look at one, one thing one way. And I actually really enjoy looking at all different perspectives on the work that I do. So especially if the sun catches your work in such a way, I think it can be really beautiful. A few other things that I've worked on uh, in the last couple of years, this is some of my hand spun yarn and, um, a bunch of building materials actually that were that we found when we were renovating our the studio space and so I just put down the building materials on the table and taped them down and use them as a makeshift loom and I just started weaving this into a, whole, a wall hanging and then I do a lot of landscapes so this is a Saskatchewan landscape um, under construction this is the first time I think I did uh, a diptych uh, so two side by side of a prairie uh, skyline. And so the yellow 
is the canola fields and the blue of course is the sky and I often am just fascinated by um yeah the way that storms particularly look in the sky um when you are on the prairies this is how they looked on the wall in the studio and then this one was special this was a commission for a friend's friend who had lost her husband and she wanted to do something special for her so she asked if i would make her a tapestry and so <clears throat> i took some of the clothing from her uh, partner and wove those pieces into a tapestry for her. Um, so on the left is the tapestry in the works in my studio. Um, I would often work on it late at night beside the fireplace. And then on the right is obviously it's finished. And I believe that that kind of a, an heirloom object um, is it takes many, many hours, of course, but I look back fondly on the process of making this for that friend's friend. Um, and I just stuck this in there because out of all of this, um, I love teaching. You know, I love teaching what it is that I do, how I do it. And I love giving people a sense of this could be my new hobby too. So I do lots of that. And other than making art, I build teams. So I do a lot of team building around creativity. Here's a team back at my old FCM office. They actually call me in to, to work with many of the teams. And uh, we did some exercises around um, circular weaving, but there were other things that we that I framed into the day and had a lot of fun with them. These were a group that came to my studio and we did some weaving as well and some other things. And in the studio, some more, some more weaving and just sharing and facilitating really good interactions between teams, um, whether we're in their boardroom or in another space, it's one of the specialties that I have. Uh, I build connection. So these were all people that are on teams or were strangers before they started and become friends and have some good laughs, work with kids, make good stuff and um, have a lot of fun finding sort of the, the interrelationship between people really, and the things that they love to do uh, by the time that they, they leave me. And I promote wellness. So I do all kinds of content around, I make guidebooks and tip sheets and I design digital courses and even more like I have a, I think Elaine has <clears throat> read a few of my blog entries, but I have a lot of information online and on my social media, although I'm not there very much these days, but uh, you can find a lot of this stuff through my, through my website. And then that studio that I keep mentioning, mentioning <laughs> other than, other than the art, I built a studio with my husband. Um, so just some quick show, show and tell. It was in a space of a building that we own next door to our house. Um, and on the left is what it looked like when we started. And then it transformed into what you see on the right. And on the left, oh, actually on both of these, this was the outdoor space. So I had a vision of wanting to be able to teach on a patio space and especially during the pandemic. So it looked like that. And we transformed it into that. So um, being able to envision a space and to design something that people actually want to spend time in is something that myself and mostly my husband, he's the, he's the brainchild behind that specialize in. So I'll just quickly flip through my art making process and then we'll get to some questions if that's okay. So five things about my art making process. It's messy at times that's indigo on my hands and that's dog fur in a bath on the right. Um, another thing about my process is that I often film it um, and take video of it. I use things that I find in my stash <clears throat> from years and years ago. So you can see that some of these, um, this one's the one on the left is quite sweet. Maven is one of my, my youngest daughter and I spun that on the day before she was born. 
and um, pre-loved textiles. Um, we'll talk about that a little bit more. And then one more thing about my art making process is that I've realized over the years that you have to practice, 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 experiment and repeat and um, spend time. So that's really something that I'm trying to focus on now. My spinning process. I had told Elaine that I was going to get all funky and try to spin for you tonight. And I just have to be honest, I don't have the energy today because I ran a marathon yesterday and I'm a little bit tired today. So, uh, so I'll just show you pictures. Um, so my spinning process looks like this. So when I prepare a fiber, um, I use a drum carter or hand cards or something to basically comb the fibers together. So I can take a bunch of different fibers that look completely like they're not going to work together. And I comb them together into something that's called an art bat. And an art bat looks like a big cloud. So it's uh, um, often big and poofy. Um, and I can use this then to create yarns on my spinning wheel. Um, I basically peel off pieces of that cloud and then feed it through the orifice, which is the piece that's sticking out the front of my wheel on the bobbin, and create yarn. And like I said before and showed you pictures before, my yarns can look really different. Um, very poofy, very um, unique. And there's me sitting at my wheel um, using, I think that was just Merino at the time. Sometimes they can be quite ugly. And then I take those yarns and I wash them. So that's the next part of my process is that I um, take them usually to a hot water bath and wash them for 10 to 20 minutes. And then I hang them out to dry. And when they're dry, then I take them and I photograph them. Um, and I used to have this makeshift light box that my daughter would sit in <laughs> and I would photograph my yarns. My weaving process. <clears throat> so sometimes I make pictures, um, but like I said, I don't follow patterns very well, um, at least with my weaving. So sometimes I make a picture of what I want to do. And then sometimes I do it digitally. This was on my iPad. Uh, and then I assemble my pieces together of what I want to use. So it often involves all kinds of different scraps of yarn and macrame cord and textiles and burlap and whatever, whatever I have lying around that um, inspires me. And I often shred up textiles um, and use whatever I can of them. I've even used um, bags before and done like whole weavings out of plastic bags uh, or ties. These were ties from my grandfather after he passed away. So uh, I love using things from people that meant something to me. T-shirts, as I told you about uh, in Nashville and other of my weavings, I use up <laughs> lots of scraps of t-shirts. And I even use things like bungee cords and twine that I find in garage garages. And here's those, uh, that makeshift weaving loom that I had on the table. Um, I put them all together on the table to sort of see if I still like what I'm using, and then I get to it. Inspiration. We're at the last of it, folks. I hope you're still with me. So just some of the things that inspire me as an artist. We're still are... with you, Carmen. Oh. We're just... <laughs> Good. Good. Um, thank you for, thanks for jumping in, Elaine. <laughs> so just a few of the things that inspire me. Um, I live in the nation's capital, so I have the great um, opportunity to go to the National Gallery as often as I can get there. Um, I literally live one kilometer from the gallery. And so things like the, um, the weaving on the left was an installation at the gallery um, it might have been last year or the year before that was done by the Matoato, Matoato people, something like that. Um, and a, like a group of women that get together and make these giant woven installations in different places in the world. So I get to see th things like that and it inspires me. Or uh, these God's Eyes that were over the street in Sayalita um, a few years back. 
um, my prairie landscapes have always inspired me, but inspire me even now, even though I don't live there anymore. Books, good books inspire me. So a few of my recommendations um, in the company of women by Grace Bonney uh, is a great book of inspiration from all kinds of makers, artists, and entrepreneurs. Uh, Elizabeth Gilbert's Big Magic is always beside my bed. It's a great read. Lots of fun to read that one. I love Lisa Congdon. Um, I love her illustrations, but I also love her writing. And I love uh, Danielle Krissa, who is the founder of The Jealous Curator. She has a wonderful social media presence um, and an excellent um, subscribed email. Um, what's it called? I think it's just the jealous curator as well, but she sends like daily inspiration for artists. So that, that one's great too. And this magazine, if you don't know of uppercase, please, please, please find it and buy it, subscribe to it. It's a Canadian no ads publication that is beautiful done by Janine Von Gool, a one woman show in Calgary. She's on episode or episode. So magazine 61 now um she hopes to get to 100 it's a quarterly publication it's beautiful you must read it i mention it to everybody i have no affiliation with it i just love it as a publication um other inspiration old things um when i find old things like the things you see on this screen i just always think what can i do with that sometimes it the answer is nothing uh, and then sometimes the answer is wow, everything. So some of these things have become dowels that I hang weavings on or little bins that have little special things in them um, or you name it. I'm inspired sometimes by my neighbor's dog hair. <laughs> this is that dog hair experiment um, that I don't think I'll ever do again, but it kind of inspired me to think differently. Um, I'm inspired by watching my kids uh, craft and create art. And I'm inspired when I see fibery type of art installations out in the world. I'm inspired by uh, women uh, that have come before that were truly pioneers in their own art lives um, back when it would have been much more difficult to do so. And I'm inspired when I take myself on artist dates like this one to the Remain Modern in Saskatoon, I think a couple of years ago now. I'm inspired by weird hats and things <laughs> that other people make that I would love to make and don't know how. I'm inspired by running, as I mentioned, uh, long distances, <laughs> and I'm inspired by being out in nature. I'm inspired by my little free library behind my house. When I found this book, I, I found this in the little free library. I literally gasped. I was like, I thought I had like found, you know, a million dollars. I'm inspired by sitting by the lake and sketching in the summertime. And I'm inspired by old clothes. And what do I have coming up? Um, I've got a few pop-up workshops. I don't do many workshops anymore. The reason I moved out of the studio was purely financial, actually. <laughs> so running a studio space as a solo uh, artist is hard. Um, and filling it up all the time doesn't really make financial sense. So I do workshops now out of other studios and other spaces in Ottawa and the area. So I've got a few coming up, one on mini macrame next weekend and tiny tapestries as well next weekend. And I'm working on a women's wellness initiative. That's sort of my newest gig right now is looking for ways to help connect women uh, to their wellness um, through art and creativity, but also through other things to help them in their midlife to feel super. So if you wanna know more about that, you can join my email list um, and my website is there. It's just my name.com. And I'm also working on a rebrand of everything that I do. So I have two websites. One of them is Ply Studio, one is Carmen Bond, and I'm gonna bring it all together. That's gonna be grand. And what else is coming up? Always spinning. I will always spin. So when I wanna be well, I sit at my spinning wheel. And one day I hope 
to have my own fleece and fiber animals. <laughs> so that is also coming up for me at some point, sometime. So just to end, I'd say I would love it if you would sign up for my emails. So as I said, I have two websites. You can get on my email list through a pop-up that's going to flash in your face when you go to either of these websites. Um, you can take a virtual workshop with me. So even though we don't live anywhere near each other, um, I do have some digital classes and workshops that are on my website, and I would be pleased if you would take some of them. That would be awesome. You can follow me on Instagram or Facebook, where I sometimes am, and tell someone about me. If you have enjoyed listening, and if you're interested in what I do, I would super love it if you could help me out, because I'm just a one-woman one, one show, and um, it always helps if someone refers me to another. So make something and feel better. I know that you already believe that, but that's been one of my taglines for years and years. And now I ask you, what questions do you have? You can ask me anything. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Yeah, and I was just going to yeah. say, before we kind of get into questions, I, I just want to say, you know, just thank you so much. And, and I think, you know, had I not put myself on mute, you, you would have kept hearing these little... <gasps> <laughs> that was happening throughout your whole presentation and 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 um and so I think it was a good thing that I kept myself on mute but I'm it is hard when you're not kind of getting that that feedback that is anybody out there is anybody still alive and I think I think I can fairly say that we were all still alive so I have had the very good fortune of having a nice long conversation with Carmen so I'm going to to turn it over to any of you if uh, you have any comments or any questions for Carmen. Just feel free to unmute yourself. There we go. Thanks, Chassie. Thanks, Chassie. So do and you ever have it? Okay. Do you I'm have, sorry. ever have any exhibitions outside of Ottawa? No, I haven't actually, not yet. Other than in my mother's living room. <laughs> but no, I haven't. I haven't very much focused on actually displaying and exhibiting my own art. Um, I've been more into the education side um, of what I do. Um, so maybe at some point I'll focus a little bit more on making more art that would be suitable for a gallery or more but um not yet very very interesting thank you anybody else have any questions oh mary lois is saying any photos of the creations you've made with plastic bags <laughs> i would, um i do and i can pass those along to elaine some of them were horrible experiments. Um, I don't know if anybody's worked with plastic bags before and tried to figure out how to make it actually look like it's not garbage. Um, <laughs> <laughs> there was an excellent, and I'll have to look her up as well. I was at the textile museum in Toronto last year. And there was an excellent artist that was on display there that does like, like award-winning and like red carpet outfits out of plastic like recycled plastic um it was unbelievable but she also said nothing about her process because she had it trademarked the process of using her um plastic so I think there's actually a real trick to it I haven't figured it out yet anybody else thanks for your uh amazing inspiring presentation i um i wonder like two questions one is your background in africa has it you know been playing something in the background of your work you know <laughs> and second yeah. i'm intrigued by your crochet hat you know how did you come up with that and would it be possible for a beginner crochet to do something like that Thanks. Oh, thanks. Thank you. Thanks for the comment on the questions. Um, 
Africa, well, any any of the places that I visit and live in in the world inspire me greatly. Um, at the time that I was living in Zimbabwe, I actually wasn't doing anything with fiber yet. So it didn't inform my art practice at the time. Um, but certainly the colors and the the sights and the sounds, and even I still have like um, some of the pods from trees. Like So when I stumble upon these things, I often do like reflect and then use them back in my art. So yeah, it still continues 20 years later to influence me. Um, the hats, absolutely. Those hats are actually failed experiments in making hats. <laughs> so um, the reason why I designed that in the first way was because I don't like to follow patterns. So I was just kind of playing around and they turned the very first one I made kind of turned out all wonky. Like um, imagine a pixie hat, pixies kind of go like that, but this one was, it was too big on one side and then too small on the other. And so it just sort of formed this weird shape. And that's where I got the idea of making these free form crochet hats that were very odd. So now, then I actually designed the yarn to be so strange that it popped out of certain sides of it and not on others. So it actually is all about the inputs that you use and going with whatever you feel like on the day that you're making it, because those hats, many of them are just a single crochet in the round. Oh, Vasana is a big crochet hat maker. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I look forward to seeing what you do next, Vasana. <laughs> I'm not sure. Um, uh, oh, thank, but thanks so much for the idea. Uh, yeah. And I would like to share with you, Carmen, uh, a link. I'm not sure if you have uh, seen, you may have seen this, uh, but when I look at some, when I saw some of your work, it reminds me of the video in this link that oh, I put wonderful. in the chat. It was I like know. stunning, you know, the work of uh, one of the, especially many of the weavers in this uh, exhibition, but one of them in particular that shows like the landscape in the prairie, the sunset, you know, the layer, oh, the colors, you know. Wonderful. I'll have a good time looking at that. Thanks for sharing that. Thank yeah, you. Thank you. Well, you know what? I know we're getting close to the end and I have the sense that we could, you know, keep chatting for a long time because it, it is really kind of just fills your cup. Um, or it just fill my cup anyhow this kind of this kind of stuff and you know I I kind of want to put out there the idea that we do a field trip to Ottawa <laughs> one of our you know think maybe think in the fall you know <laughs> but, um, it would just be fabulous too and if you ever are making your way west um, you know we would definitely organize a an in-person event even though oh. we do it here are online, but we do every, every now and again, do the, the, um, in-person event, which is our next and our next go round or next meeting in, in June. We, um, you know, last summer we got together in a park. And so just a heads up to everybody and I'll send that out in an email that we'll try to do that for our, our June, I think it's June 24th meeting. So, um, we can see if that's going to work for people or not. Um, and yeah, Carmen, just um, a big congratulations to you for for all of the bravery in transitioning from that that career into this different career and taking on all that that entails and a marathon. So <laughs> um, and and then making yourself available the day after a marathon to to spend time with us. So um, much appreciation to you for for joining us today, for inspiring us, for sharing some of these resources and these opportunities as well. Um, I if any of you had a chance to look at her website while we've been uh, together, and if not, I highly recommend because there's some fabulous stuff there. Thank you so much. It's been my pleasure to be online with all of you. Well, and I, I did record it and I admittedly, I'm just going to, I forgot to stop recording.